Hello and welcome to my guide on soloing Elite Dungeon 1 for beginners. Now, I know that on my second video ever posted on this channel, I actually explained how to solo Elite Dungeon 1, but that was actually through the melee style. And nowadays, I don't actually believe that the melee style is the easiest way to learn Elite Dungeon 1. I actually believe ranged is a significantly easier way to do it. So. This guide will cover how to solo Elite Dungeon 1 with ranged, and we're going to use fairly low level gear. I know that Elite Dungeon 1 is not easy to do at first. It can also be very intimidating, but I'm going to try to give a strategy that you can do with a fairly wide range of gear and a fairly wide range of skill level that you can hopefully use to get your first kill and maybe some more kills after that. So what is Elite Dungeon 1? Elite Dungeon 1 is officially called the Temple of Aminishi. The Temple of Aminishi holds a huge amount of acolytes of Siryu, which are followers to the final boss, Siryu the Yuzuru Serpent. There are many, many complexly shaped rooms inside this dungeon, and there's also three bosses that we'll cover how to deal with later in this video. The only requirements for this dungeon are actually completion of Impressing the Locals mini quest. 99 in all of your combat stats, 96 or better herb lore, and tier 80 or better ranged gear. I also highly recommend getting the mechanized chinchampas unlocked if you don't already have them unlocked, because these will be extremely useful when clearing mobs. I'm going to mainly be covering how to get through this dungeon using the minimum ranged gear that I think will actually be doable. If you have better gear than this, you'll probably have an easier time than I did, though it may still be a challenge to get through a lot of the bosses and a lot of the mobs. For a familiar, I highly recommend at first taking a pack yak, because this dungeon is going to be very, very, very damaging, so you're going to want to bring a lot of food to allow you to stay in that dungeon for as long as possible. In this basic inventory, I just have overloads, prayer potions, adrenaline potion, food, and bruise, and then also a shield, a ring of death, a ring of vigor which is optional, and a main hand or off hand crossbow as well as potentially chinchampas. It really depends what you're wielding at the time, but you will want to bring all the stuff in in order to help deal with the various situations you're going to get throughout this dungeon. Here is an example bare minimum loadout. Basically just bring the best range gear and accessories that you have, and that's all you need to do. I highly recommend getting a group kill at this dungeon before you attempt the solo. This will help you get a feel for what's actually going to be inside the dungeon, as well as it'll allow you to teleport directly to Elite Dungeon 1 using the PVM hub portals. To get here without using the PVM hub portals, you can teleport to Lumbridge, then run south until you find the Fremenic Shipmaster, sail using the Fremenic Shipmaster to Elite Dungeon 3, and then teleport using the outside chest to Elite Dungeon 1 or 2. In this case, we're going to be teleporting to 1. I think that's enough explaining about the dungeon. Let's actually go jump in. As you go through this dungeon, if you have two or more mobs next to each other, you're going to want to use the Chinchampas to kill the mobs. Otherwise, use your regular weapons. You're going to want to go take the left path as you start the dungeon. Ignore everything except the four mobs that are next to the barrier. Once you kill these mobs, or really any other mobs that is next to a barrier, generally that barrier will drop, allowing you to pass through. As soon as the barrier drops, run all the way down to the very end of the room, where there are eight of these melee guys standing in formation. You need to kill them, and you should use your chinchampas because they will clump up. As soon as you kill the eight melee guys, the barrier that is to your north will drop. Go immediately through that, kill the magic guys blocking that barrier, and then go through the door as soon as the barrier drops. Once you get through the door, go up and you're going to find four magic guys and a healer. You're going to want to kill all of them, the barrier will drop, and then you're going to want to choose either the left side or the right side. It doesn't really matter which side you choose, 
but you have to hug that side into the next room in order to avoid aggroing both sides of the room. You only need to aggro one side in order to kill that group of mobs in order to get through that next barrier. Once the barrier drops, run all the way down the rounded paths until you get to the chest and then take the right path and kill those three magic guys. Teleport out once you have killed those three magic guys and the barrier has dropped. Beyond this barrier is the first boss fight. You are not going to want to fight the first boss while a large amount of R-hats are attacking you. And by teleporting out and then returning to this point, the R-hats will be pushed all onto the left side, and if you come back quickly enough, you will never have to deal with these R-hats again. When you return to the dungeon, Take the chest that is immediately to your left and teleport to the second option that is now available on the chest. Go take the right path, and you're going to be entering the area for the first boss fight, the Sanctum Guardian. The Sanctum Guardian has 450,000 health points to start the fight. You'll mainly attack with ranged attacks, although he also has three special attacks as well. If this is your first time and you don't want to deal with the water spout attack I'll explain later, then you should enter and then immediately go slightly towards the left. I'll explain why you do this a little bit later. The first special attack you're actually going to encounter is the quick water spout attack. Sanctum Guardian will put his body down really quickly and then shoot a very direct water spout that will hit your character for about 3000 melee damage. You do have enough time to quickly switch to melee to defend against it, but that's about all you can do. You can also resonance this attack. Don't worry too much if this hits you unexpectedly, this is not a huge problem. The next special attack is the water spout attack. If you're standing to the left of Sanctum Guardian, you just have to move a little bit to the right, just pass the center line, and then you wait until the water spout goes all the way around, and then you go back to the left. And this is an easy way to defend against it. However, if you are caught in the waterfall, or cannot easily escape the waterfall, you can use a defensive ability to reduce the damage you take. The next special attack, Sanctum Guardian will shoot a projectile at you. You're going to see a blue adrenaline bar above your head, and when it empties, a bunch of smoke will place in a 3x3 square around your character. It is very important that you do not step into the smoke after it gets placed because you will take a huge amount of damage, roughly about 4,000 damage a tick. What you should do is, if you are expecting this kill to go along and you're having to get a lot of these smokes, then place them relatively far away from where your character was running. So, somewhat to the left, somewhat to the back, or somewhat to the right is all okay as long as you get back to your left-ish position before the water spout happens. During the time that your character's blue adrenaline bar is emptying, Sanctum Guardian will likely do another quick water spout that will do the roughly 3000 melee damage to your character. So, be ready to pray melee every time you see a blue adrenaline bar above your character. Sanctum Guardian will never water spout while your character has a blue adrenaline bar above its head. So, after the smoke, you should quickly move to the left, but you will not have to move to the left before the smoke actually gets placed. As the kill goes on, the Sanctum Guardian will start shooting the water spout attack and the smoke attack with the quick water spout attack more and more frequently. At about two minutes, the Crassian Ritual Keepers will also join the Sanctum Guardian side and attack you. So you will want to try to get the fight done quickly before these get to do too much damage to you. If you know how to deal with the water spout and the smoke attack though, you should eventually be able to get a kill. Once you kill Sanctum Guardian, any Crashian Ritual Keepers that are present on the field will instantly die. You will also be able to go through that door that was at the back of Sanctum Guardian to progress to the next part of the dungeon. If you had a hard fight at Sanctum Guardian and you're low on supplies, 
Feel free to teleport out of the fight and then return once you have restocked. Once you get past the door from the Sanctum Guardian, you run along and then once you turn right, go all the way down to the end and then you need to kill the two cloaked zealots that are guarding the bridge. Once you kill the two cloaked zealots, you'll make a left and then you may need to kill the Death Lotus rogues that are patrolling the area. If you have high level gear, you are actually perfectly fine to skip these Death Lotus rogues, but if you're using lower level gear, you have to kill them, otherwise they're going to do a ton of damage. Use your Chinchampas and maybe even use Devotion and Prey Range in order to avoid taking too much damage from the Death Lotus rogues. Once you get past the Death Lotus rogues, carry on until you find three Cloak Zealots on your left, and then kill those three Cloak Zealots. Once you're past the Cloak Zealots, run down the left side until you find another Cloak Zealot, which you kill. Then run all the way down, and then you should be able to see three Cloak Zealots guarding a staircase. Kill those three. Then you run up the staircase and kill all six Cloak Zealots that were in front of the door. And get through that door as soon as you can after that. Once you get through the door, kill the two magic guys, and if you want, you can kill the two healers as well. Once the barrier drops, you can run down and collect all of the mobs between you and the barrier, except for the Hanto Cell Swords. However, if you aggro some of the Hanto Cell Swords, you can just kill the Hanto Cell Swords first with your Jinchampas, or you can kill all the other melee mobs and then run away from the Hanto Cell Swords as soon as the barrier drops. I recommend standing where I'm standing here in order to have the safest time dealing with these mobs. If you're using low level gear, after you kill the melee mobs, take the right side and hug the wall and immediately focus on the Death Lotus Rogue that is to your right. The left Death Lotus Rogue will not aggro, but you can quickly get rid of this Death Lotus Rogue before it tries to do significant harm to your character later. Once you take out that Death Lotus Rogue, continue to take the right path and kill the four cloaked zealots blocking that barrier. As soon as those cloaked zealots die, you will probably have a lot of mobs on you. Teleport out as soon as that barrier drops. Once you teleport out, you'll definitely want to restock here, because the next boss is very, very annoying. Also, you probably burned a lot of supplies to actually get to this point in the dungeon anyway. The second boss is named Masuda the Ascended. He mainly attacks with melee attacks on the first phase. On the second phase, he will not attack you and is invulnerable. And on the third phase, he's going to mainly attack with ranged attacks with the occasional magic attack. It is very important that you are quick on your feet with this boss, otherwise you are very likely to get killed quite easily. Masuda will start the fight by attacking your character with melee a few times and then immediately follow up with a spinning attack. I recommend waiting about 3 seconds and after that use Devotion in order to completely mitigate the rest of the damage you would take from the spinning attack. Be sure to only pray melee here because you're going to get hit every single tick and if you try to soul float flick you will probably die. While spinning around he is likely to push your character around, however if you use any channeled ability he will not be able to push you around and you will continue to be able to do damage regularly. Another attack Masuda will do is you can jump up in the air and fire off a bunch of water tsunamis in somewhat random directions, somewhat-ish, pointed at your character. These can do a huge amount of damage, and if you're new, I highly recommend just running away from Masuda and waiting for this attack to be over, because it is very easy to get killed here. Another attack Masuda can do is the I'll Pulverize You attack. He'll face in one direction and then say I'll Pulverize You, and then shoot his sword out a bunch. If you're in the direction he's facing, you'll take about 3000 melee damage or more. However, the easiest way to deal with this attack is just to pray melee and ignore it. You can resonance this attack if you have good timing. However, if you're just out of the way, he'll just miss and not do any damage to you, period. If Masuda spins at you and Devotion is on cooldown, you have two options. 
You either should run away and stay away, even if this means stopping attacking Masuda for a bit, or you can use Reflect. If you use Reflect, you'll deal a decent amount of damage back to Masuda, but you will also take a significant amount of damage, and you may need to eat a bunch in order to survive. Once Masuda gets to 270,000 HP, he'll jump up in the air and stop attacking you. Instead, he's going to spawn 15 Thrashing Waters throughout the fight. However, he'll spawn less if you don't kill them quickly, and he'll spawn more of them if you do kill them quickly. You just want to kill these and kill the ones especially that are hitting you, so that when the next phase comes along, they're not hitting you while Masuda is also hitting you. If you kill any Thrashing Waters in melee distance, the Thrashing Waters will reduce the damage that Masuda's magic attack on the next phase will actually do, by 5% each. It is not necessary to do this, but this is very helpful, and probably should be recommended in a larger group. The moment you see Masuda speak again while he's floating in the air, he's going to move on to the next phase. Before you attack Masuda, you should probably kill any thrashing waters that are still hitting your character, because they will do a significant amount of damage still. Once you kill the thrashing waters, get some distance between Masuda and you, and then pr mainly prey range. If you see him jump high into the air, prey magic until the magic attack either splashes or it hits you, and then switch back to range. It is very important that you prey magic during the time when he's high up in the air, otherwise you could potentially take a 10,000 hit and die. So it is better to prey magic more often and get hit with some ranged attacks unprotected than to prey range more often and get hit by a magic attack once in a while, because the ranged attacks might do some damage to you, but the magic attacks could potentially kill you almost in one hit. Once you get Masuda down to 0 HP, you have finished the fight. Congratulations. There is actually no other mechanics on this last phase. It is just switching between magic and ranged prey. When Masuda dies, any thrashing waters that are still alive will also die at this time. At the same time, a large staircase will appear. Go through this large staircase to fight the last boss of this dungeon, Siryu the Zero Serpent. Run down until you reach a small circular area with a chest on it. Kill the center and the two pylons next to the chest. After that, you may teleport out to restock, or you can continue on to fight Siryu, the final boss. Siryu is going to be quite a long fight. He has 7.5 million life points, but you only have to get Siryu to 7.2 million life points before you can actually progress with getting the kill. You will mainly attack with magic, although you're going to see a lot of black circles spawn under you, a lot of black hands move quickly from Siryu himself, and a lot of black hands move quickly from a marked out area on the map. As well, Siryu is also going to do a huge breath, which can be a very, very strong magic hit. That could potentially kill you if you're low HP or not praying magic. To deal with the black circle spawning under you, you can either step two squares in any direction, or you can actually step to the left or back facing Siryu one square, and that will completely avoid any damage you take from the circles. To avoid the hands coming from Siryu, you just have to see the hands coming in the arrow formation, and then you move to either the left or the right of Siryu in order to avoid that. And to deal with the hands that are coming from a marked location, you can either stand on the hands, which I didn't do in this kill, or you can wait for the hands to spawn and then change your position and the hands will move in a straight line, thus missing you. For the huge breath attack, you can resonance it, or you can prey mage and devotion, or you can just tank the attack, or you can use any other defensive ability to reduce the damage. I highly recommend standing further back as you fight this boss, because it's very easy to miss a set of hands attacking you if you stand too close to where the boss is. As 7.2 million health approaches, 
start building adrenaline. You want to be at around 100%, if not actually at 100%, when 7.2 million HP arrives. At 7.2 million HP, Sirio will stop attacking and will give you a chance to jump up on the shackle. Now here is where you actually make progress on the boss fight. You're going to see there are three black crystals at the top of the shackle. You can pray Soul Split to heal up at the top of the shackle. You will not get auto-attacked. You need to kill one of these black crystals before the slimes that come from the hand at the back of the arena reach Siryu. If these reach Siryu, they will quickly heal up the black crystals. If you can kill one of these black crystals before the slimes arrive, the slimes will no longer be able to heal the dead black crystal, thus giving you progress on the fight. After the slimes arrive, don't worry too much about the second black crystal that you've moved on to because you will probably not have enough time to kill it, unless you have an extremely good DPS rotation. Wait until the fifth uber heal and then start an onslaught. Onslaught will be able to do a significant amount of damage to the black crystal without you actually doing anything particularly special. If you have Dominion Mines, you can also use them here to try to do more damage to the Black Crystal. Though you're going to have to place the Dominion Mines on the 4th Uber Heal and then Onslaught on the 5th Uber Heal. Eventually, you'll get kicked off. As soon as this happens, Freedom and then immediately attack all of the slimes to gain aggro of them. If the slimes reach Siryu, keep in mind they're going to heal the crystal that you Onslaughted just moments ago. Since you have killed one of the black crystals, the hands will move slightly faster, but the fight is actually going to be largely the same. You're going to jump up again at about 7.2 million life points at the side you jumped up before, and you're going to finish off the crystal that you onslaughted earlier. Then after the fifth uber heal, you'll onslaught the third and final crystal, or on the 4th Uber Heal, you're going to place Dominion Mines and then Onslaught on the 5th Uber Heal. Once you get kicked off the Shack Hole, you pick up the Slimes to prevent them from overhealing the Black Crystal you just Onslaughted a moment ago. And then once you get Siri to 7.2 million, you can go up either side and then easily kill the final Black Crystal. As soon as you have killed this final black crystal, you have finished the final boss and completed the Temple of Amanishi. So, if you've gotten to this point, congratulations, you have finished your first Temple of Amanishi run in solo. Now, I know that there are many more advanced ways to get through Elite Dungeon 1 than what I mentioned in this video. But I hope that what I suggested in this video will work for you to get you your first run and maybe your first few runs. Now that we've discussed how to get through the dungeon, let's explain the rewards. From my experience, the main drop that gives you money from Elite Dungeon 1 is actually the Ancient Scales. They're worth about 900,000 right now, as of May 17th, 2021. On average, I've been able to get about 12 Ancient Scales per solo run, although this can change depending on how much luck or bad luck you've had. I found that the other loot is worth roughly around one and a half million gold a run, depending on what kind of items you get. You can get lucky and get a fishy treat or a Masuda War Spear and that will be worth a few million gold each, although they're not particularly common so I don't think they're a significant increase to the average loot that is not ancient scales. It works out that you end up making about 12.3 million gold, roughly, on average, per solo Elite Dungeon 1 run. And if you can do two runs per hour, that would mean you would make 24.6 million gold an hour. And if you could do three runs an hour, 36.9 million gold an hour. Definitely, Elite Dungeon 1 can be very profitable, but it will be a bit of a challenge. Thank you for making it to the end of my soloing ED1 guide for beginners. If you learned something or enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave a like and a comment down below 
mentioning anything you learned, or if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments down below as well. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel as well. Thank you. I'll be probably releasing more guides in the future. I'll have to figure out what it'll be next, but I hope to see you all then. Bye.